Are you ready for an open discussion with the best of the best and the best of what's next? Welcome to the Spotlight with Tony D'Urso and special VIP co-hosts. Join in on a great conversation today with one of the world's great influencers as they showcase the latest tricks and techniques that made them the game changers they are today. Now, here's Tony D'Urso and his co-host. Welcome to the Spotlight. I'm your host, Tony D'Urso, and joining me today as my co-host is the Ambassador of Happiness, Maura Sweeney. She's a fellow podcaster, author, and international speaker whose living happy inside out mantra is helping to advance the human race. And if you want more of Mora, check her out at mora4u.com. That's M A U R A, the number four, the letter U.com. Hello, Mora. How are you today? Tony, I am great and I'm very excited to be here for this interview. So thank you for inviting me to sit in as your co-host today. Oh, my pleasure. And you know, I usually, you know, I've interviewed so many people, Maura, and as I am an author myself, to speak to someone and have someone so distinguished on our show today kind of has me feeling not quite like, you know, an Italian teenager. I'm like extremely excited. So just understand because it's, I really connect on this one. And before we go into that, I do want to say for our Spotlight audience, you are listening to the Spotlight, where we focus on highlighting Hollywood stars, sports greats, and game changers. If you're a fit, we want your interview on the Spotlight. We broadcast every Friday at 1 p.m., so please set your calendar to hear from the world's elite. And if you missed a show, hey, don't panic. It's okay. You can catch every show on my mobile app. Just go to Tony, D-U-R-S-O dot com slash mobile from your smart device or cell phone, and it loads, and the past episodes of the Spotlight will automatically appear in column one, and column two is my other weekly show that highlights elite entrepreneurs called Revenue Chat. All right on that. Now today, we set the stage for the Spotlight to chat with New York Times bestselling author Steve Barry. And for our audience, Steve Barry is the New York Times and number one internationally best-selling author of 12 Cotton Malone adventures and four standalone thrillers. Check this out. His books are translated into 40 languages with more than 21 million copies in 51 countries. And his books consistently appear in the top echelon of publications like New York Times, U.S. Today, and indie bestseller lists, just so we set the playing field for some of Steve's accomplishments. Well, here we go. Welcome to the spotlight, Steve. Great to be here. Well, great. Steve, it's our honor to have you join us, and I really appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule and writing and your amazing travels to join us on the spotlight. Well, I'm glad to be. It's my first visit to your show. Well, good. Hopefully, we'll we'll bring you back as well. Let's see. First things first, Steve. Could, let's start here. Could you tell us how it all started for you? Well, I mean, I didn't write my first word until I was 35 years old. And I was a lawyer in a small town in Georgia. And I'd been practicing at that point for about 20, 20 years. Uh, and uh, no, I'm sorry, about 10 years at that point, about 10 years. And I had a little voice in my head that told me to write. Now, every writer I've ever met has a little voice in their head that tells them to write. And it doesn't say, you know, write a bestseller, sell a bunch of books and do all that. It doesn't say that at all. It just says, I want you to sit down. I want you to write. I I ignored that voice for um, 10 years. Finally, in um, 1990, I sat down and I wrote a book. Took me a year to write it. I got through. It was horrible. It was 170,000 words. Horrendous (laughs) manuscript. Uh, I don't even have to tell you how bad it is. Just tell you it was 170,000 words long. Uh, but it, it's actually the finest thing I will ever write in my life. And I kept it and I keep it to this day. It sits on my desk where I see it every day. The reason why is because I started it and I finished it. You know, most writers, uh, 90% of all writers do not finish what they start. I at least finished it. It was horrendous, but I got it done. So uh, I sat down though, and I wrote seven more novels over the next uh, 11 years. Five went to New York houses, rejected 85 times. I was finally, I finally made it on the 86th time. Oh my! 12 years after I wrote my first word. 
So for me, it was a it was a long process. The Amber Room was published in 03. Did very well. Uh, Romanoff Prophecy came next, Third Secret after that, and then Templar Legacy in 2006 was my breakout book. It was the book that kind of kicked me up a notch, and and I've been going strong ever since. That is amazing, and I totally understand, as I'm a fellow writer as well. Steve, could you take us back to some memorable moments in your career, perhaps, like when you first started becoming the sensation that they are now? I'd like to kind of visit that moment, please. Well, I mean, as I said, it was, uh, you know, the first three books did very well. The Templar Legacy went through the roof uh, and did just superb. Uh, it came out in spring of 06. And we rode the last wave of the Da Vinci Code right before the movie came out uh, when Da Vinci Code began to fade from the bestseller list. But we had, I had a great run there uh, with it. It was a, And then Alexandria Link came after that. And in each book after that just did extremely well. I created Cotton Malone in Templar Legacy, and I started a series there. My first three books were standalones. The uh, the fourth book is a series, and you know Cotton has now been in uh, twelve adventures, and uh, he's served me well over, since two thousand and six, and done a great job. And each book has just built a good audience. And see, my career I, I'm not a I'm not a, a, a an overnight wonder. My career has built very slowly, year after year, for the last 14 years. Very impressive. Well, I should open up by saying, Steve, for all of those of us out here who are history, thriller, and spycraft readers, this is not only a great honor to have you on, but it's wonderful to be able to get a little insights into the background of why you write and what you've write. I wondered if you can focus in a little bit about why you chose to write about the Knights of the Golden Circle, maybe especially for those who've not heard of them before. What is it about that organization that's so special and so intriguing in your writing? Well, it was the largest, most dangerous, most effective clandestine organization in American history. And that got my attention. I mean, uh, at one point, it had 40,000 people in it, and that's in 1852. So that's a lot of people. By 1860, it was up to 40,000 40, people. Uh, it was the South's counterintelligence organization, so it wreaked havoc on the North. They were very effective at what they did. They had grandiose plans of taking over Mexico and the Caribbean and creating a giant golden circle of 11 new states that would alter the balance of power in Congress. They wanted to work within the system, but the Civil, the civil War changed all that because they became then an intelligence organization for the South, and, and it, everything changed. But they had plans before that to, to, to create their golden circle of 11 new states. It was quite grandiose. It was quite amazing. And it lingered after the war for a while, and some say it lingered on to the early part of the 20th century. No one knows for sure. But what really fascinated me about them more than anything was that they were really, really good at stealing. They <laughs> stole gold and silver, just tons of it. They stole it from people, from banks, from governments, from the U.S. Mint. And they hid the gold all across the South in the ground. And they left clues in the woods how to find the gold. And this is not me making this up. This is actually true. And the gold is still there. And people have been searching for it for 150 years. And the treasure hunt that Cot Malone engages in in chapter one of the novel is actually a combination of four actual treasure hunts that happened in the 1990s when gold was actually found, Knights of the Golden Circle gold. The vast majority of their gold has never been located. That's amazing. I want to ask how you've come up with the names, first of all, of your people as a fiction writer. I've written one fiction book and three nonfiction, and my fiction book is actually a series. The first book is The Pursuit, which did well, and now the second book, Dark Horizons, is ready to go, and I'm looking for a good publisher on that. But and while I have my own methodology on how I come up with the names of my characters, I'm fascinated, as simple as it may seem, you've got names such as Cotton and Cassiopeia. How do you come up with these names and, de and determine what you're going to call your characters? 
Well, Cotton's name was not my invention. I named him something else. And one of the ladies in my writer's group thought it was stupid. And she said, I said, well, what do you want to call him? And she said, I'd like to call him Cotton. So she actually (laughs) named him. And I appreciate it because it's a great name. So it's a Southern kind of name and, and it fits very well. And how Cotton got his name in Cotton's world is explained in The Lost Order. Uh, I, st- I always said in, in the other books, he would be asked about his name and he would say, long story. He would say, it's a long story. But finally, in Lost Order, we explain that story. Uh, Cassiopeia was interesting. She came from uh, the constellation. I just added an E in it. I put an E in the air, which the constellation doesn't have it. So you would say it Cassiopeia or Cassiopeia, either one. Um, that's where her name came from. And her last name is Vit, just a short quick name because the first name's kind of long. As you know, when you're naming characters in fiction, you have to pay attention to how they sound, how it rolls off your tongue, how you're going to refer to that character. Does it make sense, that name? Is it confusing in any way? You also have to be careful about too many names starting with the same letter. So I have to make sure that when I name characters in a book, I don't have characters with the same. I try to have a different letter starting every name. And, you know, this it's all part of it. My foreign people, I try to find names that you can actually pronounce in your brain, but it connotates the country that I'm after. Uh, You don't want to have a name that people can't pronounce or at least sound out in their brain. So naming characters in a novel, there's a method to the madness, definitely. Very cool. Thanks for sharing that. I appreciate that. One of the care, one of the countries in one of my books is Nordic, so I just picked Nordic names, and the other is Japanese. I picked Asian names and actually Japanese names for them, and it kind of worked. But I made them very unique, similar along the same convention you use. Very cool. Back to the knights, they existed. That's a fact. They had tons of money. That's a fact. So they must still exist today, even if it's underground or or hidden. Is that yeah. so? There's a there's a line of authority that says they may still be out there, but I I, I doubt it. Uh, I have them exist in the novel uh, in a different format today. You know, a lot of people think that the Ku Klux Klan came out of the Knights. They did not actually. the The Klan came from a from a completely different different origin. The Knights were pretty much. I'm sure that members of the Knights eventually became Klansmen, but it was not a natural progression from one to the other. The knights were gone by the time the clan emerged. So in the uh, with the knights still being out there today, I don't I don't know. It, it, it's, it's interesting. There are people who do believe that they are still out there today. Very interesting. Makes sense, if, especially if they're looking for the lost treasure. You know, well, that, that treasure is that treasure is definitely still out there. And there's treasure hunters that have been after it for a long, long time. Amazing. Well, I'm thinking I'm sure that somebody has to still be part of that Knights group if there's a lot of treasure out there. I wanted to switch just a little bit. The Knights have a motto, and the motto in your book is to maintain the Constitution as it is and to restore the Union as it was. Can you tell us a little bit about the meaning of that motto? This is The Spotlight with Tony D'Urso and the Ambassador of Happiness, Maura Sweeney, Joining me as co-host. Just ahead, we continue the chat with New York Times bestselling author Steve Barry. But first, it's time for us to take a short break. See you back here in just a moment. I'm busy and so is my family. Leftover pizza and unhealthy takeout isn't really doing it for us anymore. Just ask my bathroom scale. That all changed when I found Freshly. For less than $10 a meal, Freshly delivers six meals a week, always fresh, never frozen, prepared by top chefs and nutritionists using the best, freshest, gluten-free ingredients. The best part is the menu is always new and fresh, just like the food, and it only takes three minutes for me to prepare breakfast, lunch, or dinner, and there's no messy cleanup and no dishes. 
My family loves the choices and the taste and Freshly delivers to my home and my office so I eat healthy all day every day. If you're tired of the same old cardboard delivery and takeout, try out Freshly.com today and save $20 on your first order using coupon code VAH639 at Freshly.com. Your taste buds and your scale will thank you. So save 20 bucks today with coupon code VAH639 at Freshly.com. The Dream Business Community wants to help you with your career and business. Are you ready for accelerated success? Check it out. The Dream Business Community at Tony, D-U-R-S-O dot com slash community. Are you the right fit? We're looking for a few good sponsors that are the right fit for our world-class brand. The Spotlight with Tony D'Urso. Does your brand fit in with an audience that likes our interviews with Hollywood stars, sports greats, game changers? If so, let's see how we can promote your brand to the best audience to help you grow. Email me at Tony at Tony D-U-R-S-O dot com and let's see how we can help. That's Tony at Tony D-U-R-S-O dot com. Is it true that a majority of new businesses fail? Check this out. In order to have a successful growing business, there are some vital points that you must know. You must have worked them out thoroughly. They must be synchronized with each other and all employees, consultants, and companies that you depend on must know these items and be in agreement with them if your new business is to meet with a high percentage of success. Get it free. The Vision Map, Beat the Odds for Business Success at Tony, D-U-R-S-O dot com slash vision. Learn how to establish your vision, purpose, long-term objective, and master plan, including strategic and tactical planning. Get the Vision Map, Beat the Odds for Business Success at Tony, D-U-R-S-O dot com slash vision, V-I-S-I-O-N. You're listening to The Spotlight with Tony D'Urso and a special VIP co-host. We'd love to hear from you via email. Be sure to send questions and comments to Tony at TonyDurso.com. Now, back to The Spotlight. All right, we're back with Tony D'Urso on The Spotlight with the Ambassador of Happiness, Maura Sweeney, as co-host. Today's show is with New York Times best-selling author Steve Barry, who's also the number one internationally best-selling author of 12 Cotton Malone Adventures and four standalone thrillers. His books are translated into 40 languages with more than 21 million copies in 51 countries. And now, back to the chat with Steve. Well, you have to understand, and most Americans don't understand this, but the um, the Constitution of the United States actually sanctions slavery. It actually makes it a legal entity and uh, and 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 protects it. There are clauses in the Constitution that protect slavery. So that's what they mean when they say we want the Constitution as it is. We want it just like it is. It, it protects slavery. It allows it. Leave it alone. We want the union as it was, and that means back together. They want it together. They were the the knights were not separatists, not at all. The knights of the golden circle were just the opposite of that. They wanted to work within the constitution to add eleven new states to change the balance of power. So they were not separatists in any way. Uh, Now the Civil War changed that because they fought for the South. But if they had had their way, they would have never. They would have not gone that route. So that's what it means. Very interesting. Yes. With 30,000, 40,000 members in the past, were there any that are very well known or very notable members? Well, that's hard to say because the records regarding the Knights disappeared after the war. Uh, All of those records were destroyed when Richmond was taken. 
So it's hard to know. Their, their, their membership rosters are about impossible to know for sure. They're gone. But most people believe that Jesse James was a knight of the Golden Circle, uh, that he robbed those banks and he stole all that money and it was given over to the knights because that's what they did from around 1865 to about 1875. They stole more gold and hid it all around the South in anticipation of a renewed civil war. So, uh, you know, Jesse James stole a lot of money and gold, but he lived very simply, very, very simply. And most people wonder what happened to that. And there's a whole line of authority that believe that he would have, uh, that he may have been a knight. Uh, a lot of people think that James uh, Wilkes Booth was a, uh, was a knight. We'll never know that because assassination of Lincoln was you know, certainly something the Knights would have engaged in as part of their counterintelligence operations during the Civil War. No question about that. But we'll never know for sure if he was a Knight or not. It's just, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it certainly fits, but we don't know. That's very interesting. And all this treasure. Now, I would think that if I or a group of people that I belong to found the treasure, the first thing, we wouldn't tell anybody. So, I think treasure hunters will still think that it's there, but it could theoretically be all gone. Or do you think well, the, that there is evidence of that? No, the, the big problem looking for this treasure now is it all lies on private land. So you can't go traipsing all over everyone's land looking for this anymore. That's why I put my particular treasure hunt in the novel on public land. I put it in a national park. But the problem is, is most of this treasure now exists uh, on private land, and you've got to get permission to go on there and do that. And so that's why it's more very difficult to locate it. Makes great sense. I see. Hmm. You have my mind going in so many ways. <laughs> um, Steve, this is a fascinating story because I could see how much it intersects with history. Obviously, you enjoy the writing. What do you think are the elements of this book and all the others that you've written in the series that really capture such an avid following of readers? Well, my books are really action, history, secrets, conspiracies. I mean, that's really what my, um, you know, that's that's my formula. And that's <clears throat> that's called an international suspense thriller. And with that in place, I mean, that's what, you know, people love that kind of stuff. They love that genre. You know, of course, Dan Brown is the king of our genre. Cussler's in our genre. James Rollins is in our genre. There's, a, there's about six or eight of us that, that write these kinds of things on a consistent basis. And I think people like that. What makes my books a little extra special is that they are um, 90% kept to history. I keep them as close to history as I possibly can. It's a little bit of a curse because it's, it makes it difficult for me to write it, but uh, that's my niche, to keep it as close to reality as I can keep it, because I found the readers like that. And then I have a writer's note in the back of the book that tells you where I deviated from history so that you will know exactly what's true and what was not. Very cool. And by the way, that writer's note is fascinating as not only a synopsis of what occurs in the book, but it, it tells and has so much information. It begs you to read the book because you'll find so many pieces are true and I, I won't even go into it, but there's so many parts of it in that writer's note. Very, very cool. And I notice that your story hinges a, around a lot around the Smithsonian library. And I'm wondering, why is this like the central <laughs> hub of, of this thriller? Because I serve on the Smithsonian Library's advisory board, and I, uh, I'm, the libraries are very special to me. And I wanted to put Cotton into that world for quite some time now. And this was my opportunity to put him into that world. I wanted people to know the libraries exist. There are 22 of them. Collectively, they're one of the largest repositories of knowledge in the world. We have an amazing amount of collections up there, incredible amounts of, uh, uh, of stuff. And I wanted the reader to know that they existed and that they're there. So um, uh, that's the main reason I put it in there is, uh, is I wanted to, to draw attention to the libraries. I wanted the Smithsonian to be front and center. 
we actually launched the book uh, at the Smithsonian Castle on the night of April the uh, the third, I think it was no the fifth, April fifth, I think it was. We launched it that night in the Smithsonian Castle. Very cool. And speaking of cotton and the the history here, there's a Cotton Malone who is the detective, or is, if I have that right, the political detective, and he's related in the book to Cotton Adams, who was yeah. a knight. Now. Is is this Knight of the Golden Circle, is there anything in your family tree or lineage or heritage of this sort of organization? No, not at all. I, I just, there's, nothing, there's nothing biographical here at all. It's all, all for Cotton. Uh, Cotton Adams is based on uh, the Confederate's most successful spy, a man by the name of Captain Thomas Hines. I read his story a few years ago, and when I read it, I realized that that was going to be how Cotton got his name. And so the story in the book about where Cotton's name comes from is actually taken from Thomas Hines' life. It actually happened to him. So it's a, it's a, it's, it was fascinating. When I read it, I knew then that would be how it would work. Oh, very cool. Well, again, I'm listening to on so many <laughs> levels, and I like the fact that you're not only entertaining people with these thrillers, but it seems that in the process, you're actually educating people to history, in this case, also to the Smithsonian libraries. I have a question that involves travel. Um, this Cotton Malone adventure spans the United States from Washington, D.C. to Tennessee to Arkansas and to New Mexico. Did you have to engage in any personal travel in order to put this story together? Can you speak yeah, we, a little about it? Yeah, I was in. I went. We we went to Arkansas and uh, that whole area in Arkansas, which is uh, you know the western and northwestern Arkansas, is a little treasure that a lot of people don't know about. It's absolutely gorgeous there. It's an amazing uh, little place there in the center of the country. Uh, I did not go to the Carson National Forest, which is in the climax of the book. I had to rely on photographs for that. I was not able to go there, but I did make several trips to the Smithsonian in, in, in Washington, D.C. All of the all of the things you see in the Smithsonian, all of the back rooms and all of the, the tunnels and all of the cool things that are there are actually there. And I walked those and I went through all of those and saw everything there. So the travel in this book was mainly through the back corridors and, and secret passageways of the Smithsonian. Very cool. Very interesting. And speaking of the Smithsonian, and I, and I think that's fantastic you're on their advisory board, you have a program called History Matters. Could you tell us about that, please? Yeah, so it's a foundation that my wife Elizabeth and I created uh, eight years ago, and it's dedicated to raising uh, money for historic preservation around the country. Uh, we go into a community and we will do a meet and greet or we'll do a dinner or we'll do a main, a main way of doing it is we put on a writer's workshop. We teach four hours the craft of writing. You buy your way in with a contribution and all of the money raised from whatever project we go there to do, all of that money goes to the, the restoration project that we're sponsoring. We don't charge to come or anything. We actually pay our own way to go to these places. We've raised a little over a million dollars for about 80 different projects around the country. So it's been very rewarding. Uh, we do around three to five a year uh, when we go and, 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 and do one. Uh, it's... Um, it's been quite interesting. I've, I've enjoyed it. It's a way to give back. If anyone out there has a project they might be interested in, they can go to my website, which is steveberry.org, click on History Matters, send us an email, and we'll see if we can come help you out. I got you. Very cool. That's a lot of money to raise. Can you, can you tell us a little bit more about the restoration project and what, is, what sort of projects that you like to be involved in with your program? Well, we've done a little bit of everything. We've done buildings, documents, artifacts, land, cemeteries, uh, libraries. We've done all kinds of things around the country. Uh, we've raised money to fix the roof on a museum that was leaking and destroying the building. We've raised money to restore an historic cemetery that was uh, damaged in a tornado. Uh, we raised money for uh, the Mark Twain House, the Lincoln Log Cabin in Illinois, uh, we've done a couple of things for the Smithsonian. Uh, we've done uh, the uh, the P.T. Barnum Museum, which was interesting. We raised money to restore some 19th century posters. 
We did an oral history project in Myrtle Beach, which is our very first History Matters project. We've done all kinds of things because historic preservation crosses a wide spectrum, so we don't limit it. We'll, we'll, we'll come help you whatever you got. That's amazing. I love it. Yes, I, and I'm thinking this is very synergistic with um, writing about history and then helping to bring focus on things you want to preserve. So you're really very, very nice. All right, I'm wondering, though, with the questions that we're asking you, is there something, Steve, that you feel very passionate about, whether it's your writing or this book or anything on a larger scale that you would like our Spotlight listeners to know about? This is the Spotlight with Tony D'Urso and the Ambassador of Happiness, Maura Sweeney, as co-host. Just ahead, we're going to find out more from New York Times bestselling author, Steve Barry. But first, it's time for us to take a short break. See you back here in just a moment. Life is complicated and sometimes we all need a little help, but don't have the time for a full hour-long session or don't know who to turn to. That's where BetterHelp comes into play. With BetterHelp, I can get matched with one of over 2,500 licensed and approved counselors and therapists and get help anytime, anywhere, totally private. For a flat weekly fee starting at $35, I can connect with my counselor via text, chat, video conference, or phone, which is great for me because I'm always on the go. And I can go back to previous sessions whenever I want through my secure account from anywhere in the world. It's a great feeling to know that help is there, affordable, private, and convenient to my schedule. We all can use a little help. Visit betterhelp.com forward slash VA health and register for free. You can try it for seven days without being charged on your credit card and get matched with a licensed counselor usually within 24 hours. Get better help today at betterhelp.com forward slash VA health. Is it true that a majority of new businesses fail? Check this out. In order to have a successful growing business, there are some vital points that you must know. You must have worked them out thoroughly. They must be synchronized with each other and all employees, consultants, and companies that you depend on must know these items and be in agreement with them if your new business is to meet with a high percentage of success. Get it free. The Vision Map, Beat the Odds for Business Success at TonyDurso.com slash vision. Learn how to establish your vision, purpose, long-term objective, and master plan, including strategic and tactical planning. Get the Vision Map, Beat the Odds for Business Success at TonyDurso.com slash vision, V-I-S-I-O-N. The Dream Business Community wants to help you with your career and business. Are you ready for accelerated success? Check it out. The Dream Business Community at TonyDurso.com slash community. Are you the right fit? We're looking for a few good sponsors that are the right fit for our world-class brand. The Spotlight with Tony D'Urso. Does your brand fit in with an audience that likes our interviews with Hollywood stars, sports greats, game changers? If so, let's see how we can promote your brand to the best audience to help you grow. Email me at Tony at TonyDurso.com and let's see how we can help. That's Tony at TonyDurso.com. You're listening to The Spotlight with Tony D'Urso and a special VIP co-host. We'd love to hear from you via email. Be sure to send questions and comments to Tony at TonyDurso.com. Now, back to The Spotlight. All right, we're back with Tony D'Urso on The Spotlight with the Ambassador of Happiness, Maura Sweeney, as co-host. Today's show is with New York Times bestselling author, Steve Barry, he's also the number one internationally best-selling author of 12 Cotton Malone Adventures and four standalone thrillers. His books are translated into 40 languages with more than 21 million copies in 51 countries. All right, 
Back to the chat with Steve. That I'm passionate about. Anything, anything that maybe we've overlooked to ask you, but that you would like other people to know about you, your writings, your initiatives, anything. No, I mean, I, I, as you pretty much kind of covered everything. I mean, I don't have, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I, I'm passionate about libraries. I really, I love libraries, and I, and I do a lot of work with them. I was a county commissioner for fourteen years, for for ten years, and I served as chairman of our local library board for a long, long time. So libraries have always been very special to me. I'm very fortunate to be able to work with the Smithsonian libraries now. So that's really what I'm more. I get very passionate about the Smithsonian libraries. And if people are interested in the Smithsonian libraries, they can go to the Smithsonian libraries website and check it out. They may find it fascinating. They may not realize what we have there. We have some incredible things. And you can actually adopt a book there. You can actually adopt one of the rare books and help restore that book. And it's really cool because you get your name in the book. It becomes your book. You can come visit your book. You can bring people to come see your book. And you can adopt these books very cheaply, some for $100, $200, whatever it costs that we need to restore the book. So I'm very passionate about that, you know, and keeping our treasures safe. I love it. Steve, we have authors and aspiring writers and writers in our audience. Can you give us some words of wisdom, best advice for them? Well, the number one advice any writer has to remember, and it sounds cliche, but it's not. It's actually the most important thing a writer can never forget. You have to write. A writer has to write. As I told you, 90% of all writers do not finish what they start. But you see, the vast majority of writers do not write to be published. The vast majority of writers write because they have a little voice in their head that tells them to write. And that's what they, they, they satisfy that voice. We've taught over 3,000 students in our workshops, and we've learned that, that most people write because they have the little voice in their head. But you have to write. You have to learn your craft. Writing, the great thing about writing is it's an acquired skill that anybody can acquire. There's no magic to it. Anyone can acquire the skill of the craft of writing if you set your mind to it. So my advice to them is to learn your craft, write every day, and apply yourself. I am living proof. If you want to be published, it can be done. I mean, 12 years, 85 rejections, but I finally made it. That's amazing. And by the way, on your books, your website again is steveberry.org, and I believe just about all of your books can be can be uh, purchased or accessed through that site? Yes, uh, everything is there. You can learn all about me, the books, everything is there. Yes, at steveberry.org. And by the way, I happen to notice that on your contact page that you read every email and every communication that comes through, even though there might be so many that others respond. Yeah, I, every every one of those emails from the website, I, I read. I, uh, my... Um, I have someone else who actually answers them, though I do answer some myself occasionally. So, but I do read every one. That's very cool. Very cool. You know, I'm I'm glad you brought you asked the question about advice for any aspiring authors. When we opened up this interview, I had no idea about your background and how long it took you to reach stardom. And I think that that is so inspiring. It also shows so much tenacity and really a commitment to what you're doing. So I think that that is fantastic advice to other writers, but it, it's also a great testament to the commitment that you have to what you're doing. And obviously, I'm sure there's a lot of readers out there that want to say thank you for it, too. How about this as a final question coming from my way, as I'm thinking about and imagining all of the stories you've written, have you ever thought or have you ever been approached by a movie studio saying, can we take your series and turn them into some epic films? All the time. We get, um, we probably get 15, 20 inquiries a year. Uh, they come constantly. Um, they're all the time, but nobody ever comes with a check and no one ever follows through on them. So uh, a lot of, a lot of talk, but no action. Maybe one day. I got you, Steve. So if you get someone that's serious and willing basically to put their money where their mouth is, you're open to serializing, or excuse me, that's not the right word, to to making a movie and or series out of your, especially your Cotton Malone adventure. Oh, absolutely. I'd I'd even, I'd love to be streaming on Netflix or Amazon. I think that'd be a great platform to be on. (laughs) The great thing about those are you're never canceled. You're there forever. 
Exactly, exactly. Well, good. Well, I definitely hope that you get some, some good doors open as a result of this interview. And I'd like to know, I understand, and I know very well, and I'm actually holding a copy of your magnificent book, The Lost Order, in my hand. It's, it's a wonderful read. I'm just getting into it, and I'm not going to spoil anything for the audience. And I understand that you're, you know, you want the world to know about this, and it, it's moving well. I'd like to know next, what's, what's the future hold for you, Steve? What, what are your, your next plans? Well, the next book comes out March 20th of next year. You stay a year ahead in the book business, so I'm a full year ahead. comes out March 20th. It's called The Bishop's Pawn. It's going to deal with the assassination of Martin Luther King, which next year is the 50th anniversary of that event. And I have an interesting take on it, something fascinating, something that I think is going to intrigue the reader. Uh, it did intrigue me. And so uh, it's, a, it's an interesting story. You're going to learn how Cotton became a Magellan Billet agent. It goes back 18 years when he was a young lawyer. And you're going to learn a lot about his background. And I'm writing the book for 2019 now that I'll turn in in 18, in early part of 18. That'll be Cotton Malone's next adventure where he's going to go back overseas. I'm going to send him. We've been doing domestic thrillers for a few years. He's headed back overseas for the next few years. Oh, great. So we have at least two more Cotton Malone adventures coming out. We have four. There'll be four more, actually. And uh, one's already done. One I'm writing on. Two more will come, one in 20 and 21. Absolutely amazing. And again, you're going to travel and go to all these various events, naturally, that the, the your characters go through? Yes. Uh, yeah, I've already done the travel for the 2019 novel. It, it involves the island of Malta, which is one of the, my favorite places. And so uh, I've been there twice, so it's going to involve that. And then uh, the, I'll be doing the traveling for the 2020 and 21 books probably next year and into the following year. So, yes, yeah, so all that's on the schedule. I stay, I try to stay about two years ahead of myself. <laughs> very, very cool. Well, I know we're kind of nearing uh, the latter part of this interview. Steve, we have talked about so much today so that our audience can stay attuned to your most recent book, which is The Lost Order. Can you give us all like a 30-second commercial on it so everybody that has not been out there to read this book will be enticed to go out? Mine is actually arriving tomorrow. <laughs> In the mail. Oh, great. Uh, on the law store, 30 seconds, huh? Um, oh, we, well, you, thir- please take, a take minute more or time. Two. <laughs> You're, as long as you like, but make it your commercial. Well, I think the, the best way to put it would be, you know, that I, I'll be repeating myself just a little bit, but you know, the, the, to me, the best hook is, you know, the, the Knights of the Golden Circle was the largest, most dangerous clandestine organization in American history. And it amassed billions in stolen gold and silver, and they buried it all over the United States in hidden caches. And ever since 1865, treasure hunters have searched for it, but little has ever been found. And now two factions of the, what remains of the Knights are after that treasure, and Cot Malone is caught up in the middle of that. And not only is he caught up in the middle of that, but he also gets caught up in some intrigue that deals with the United States Senate the United States House of Representatives, and something that could alter the American political landscape. And it's not something I made up. It's actually something that's real. And so this book goes from the back rooms of the Smithsonian to the deepest woods of Arkansas then up into the mountains of northern New Mexico. So that, that you know, it's a, it's a great adventure uh, into, our, into our past and, uh, and, and a potentially even darker future. How about that? I think that's totally intriguing, and to know that it's based on truth should make everybody think, I need to know more, and I need to learn about this. Mm-hmm. Quite a bit of truth, actually. I, I've seen some History Channel documentaries in the past about Jesse James and the lost gold, and there were there was something called a paycheck, which was, if, as I seem to recall from the those documentaries, just a jar, a mason jar or something, and there was there would be certain money in it, and and that person who was guarding the gold or the the treasure stash, he would go and get his paycheck as his compensation for. Yes. Or, is that am I am I correct so far? On yeah, that? the person. Yeah, yeah, the person who guarded the the the, the caches was called a sentinel, and they kept an eye on everything to make sure no one just sort of ventured in to, and got too nosy. And they were called paycheck hole. 
and they were told where those were located, and they went and dug those up, and that's how they were paid for their services. They were never told where the actual gold was located in the territory they were guarding, but they were only told where they could go get these small little caches to have themselves paid. This is all real, and it all happened. We know this because people have found some of these paycheck holes and have actually talked to some of these sentinels in the past. This is the Spotlight with Tony D'Urso and the Ambassador of Happiness, Maura Sweeney, as co-host. Just ahead, Steve shares more insights about his books and career. But first, it's time for us to take a short break. See you back here in just a moment. Are you the right fit? We're looking for a few good sponsors that are the right fit for our world-class brand, The Spotlight with Tony D'Urso. Does your brand fit in with an audience that likes our interviews with Hollywood stars, sports greats, game changers? If so, let's see how we can promote your brand to the best audience to help you grow. Email me at Tony at Tony, dot com, and let's see how we can help. That's Tony at Tony, D-U-R-S-O dot com. The Dream Business Community wants to help you with your career and business. Are you ready for accelerated success? Check it out. The Dream Business Community at Tony, D-U-R-S-O dot com slash community. Is it true that a majority of new businesses fail? Check this out. In order to have a successful growing business, there are some vital points that you must know. You must have worked them out thoroughly. They must be synchronized with each other and all employees, consultants, and companies that you depend on must know these items and be in agreement with them if your new business is to meet with a high percentage of success. Get it free. The Vision Map, Beat the Odds for Business Success at Tony, D-U-R-S-O dot com slash vision. Learn how to establish your vision, purpose, long-term objective, and master plan, including strategic and tactical planning. Get the Vision Map, Beat the Odds for Business Success at Tony, D-U-R-S-O dot com slash vision, V-I-S-I-O-N. You're listening to The Spotlight with Tony D'Urso and a special VIP co-host. We'd love to hear from you via email. Be sure to send questions and comments to Tony at TonyDurso.com. Now, back to The Spotlight. All right, we're back with Tony D'Urso on The Spotlight with the Ambassador of Happiness, Morris Sweeney, as co-host. Today's show is with New York Times best-selling author, Steve Barry. All right, and now, back to the chat. And that begs the question, if the Sentinel is guarding the area Uh and he's getting compensated, who knows really where the treasure is, please? Even if you have to go off of historical documents, I mean... You would assume it would have been the hierarchy of the Knights of the Golden Circle, which would know where that is. You'd have to be able to interpret the clues in the ground. They left clues how to find it in the ground. All you have to know is how to read those clues. You would assume that the people who created the clues would know how to read the clues. So they would have been able to do it. The trouble is they died off. By 1900, they're all dead. And the gold's still in the ground. And it was forgotten until the 1950s when it was sort of there was interest in this that was created again. And then in the 1980s and 90s, it got a little more heated up. So it actually just kind of got forgotten by time. And only recently has it been resurfaced. And when I read about that, I realized there was a thriller in there somewhere. I'll say. I'm just, I can't wait to read the book starting tomorrow, and then I'll be (laughs) heading out on the road, and so I'll enjoy it. But uh, there is a secondary thought that came to mind. With all of this intrigue and all of the history, uh, Steve, do you find that there are younger students that really get hooked on your books and in so doing end up really tuning into a history maybe that they're not always familiar with? 
I've had people come. I've had uh, you know teenagers and uh, and college kids come to the uh, to the events and tell me just that right there that they 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 really hate history but they love reading my novel and I make it clear that you know I'm not a historian and I you know but I do try to take and keep the story as close to reality as I possibly can and I put the writer's note in the back to tell you where I'm not so that you can you'll know what's not real. And they enjoy that because history is a story. And if you can tell history as a story, you can hold people's attention. And that's what I try to do. I try to just tell a story and keep their interest so they will enjoy it. And along the way, they all at once realize they're actually learning something, too. I would think so. I, you know, I used to homeschool our daughter, and I remember first doing history out of history books, and you know how dry it can be. And then I later turned on to historical fiction, and it just brought history alive and made it relatable and also provided the context to help not only me as the instructor, but my daughter as well, to see all the connections of how history really plays itself out in matters that affect us today and that are real, not just dates on a calendar. So just listening to you, I would think, wow, I would imagine young students getting caught up in the excitement, the adventure, and then even the separating, as you have at the end of the book, of, okay, these are the little elements that are the real history. I would think that you'd really get them thinking in brand new ways and maybe raise up a whole new generation of potential history teachers or more. Well, we hope. That's the, that's the goal, that people will get excited about it. And I, I try to find interesting things from the past, things you don't know a lot about, things, though, that you want to know more about that's fascinating enough to know more about. And that's the trick that I go after, looking for those things. And then I weave a tale around it to try to keep your attention. And as I said, I'm not a historian. I'm just a guy that reads 400 books on one subject. So I can I can I can kind of give you a little bit of perspective on that one subject. That's fascinating. Steve, what's interesting is you are, I don't know if you still are an attorney, but you were an attorney for a number of years, correct? I, yeah, I still have my license. I just don't practice anymore. Okay. And if, so from attorney to international action thriller writer and you're so much involved in history and the Smithsonian you, you're almost like have that pseudo identity of a, an historian, which is very interesting. Was this a passion for you when you grew up? I mean, you obviously, your channel went towards being an attorney. And by the way, I believe that's where Maura, our co-host, her, she was going to be an attorney too. But you, you, even though you went for it and you became an attorney, you've seemed to have changed. So I wonder if this was perhaps some calling or some passion or hobby you liked as a child. Well, I loved history always. I read I read history since I was, uh, you know, since a teenager. My very first adult fiction book I ever read was Hawaii by James Michener, which and I was absolutely hooked. And and Michener is still my favorite writer of all time. And he was the you know he was the master of of, of using history in, in 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 a story. He was so good at it. But I say all the time when you write, you you should not write what you know. That's very bad advice. You know, don't ever write what you know. Instead, write what you love. If what you know and what you love are the same thing, wonderful. But for me, it wasn't. I was a lawyer. I knew that. But I loved action, history, secrets, conspiracies. And so that's what I read. So when I started writing, I gravitated to write what I love. And, you know, they were escape. They're an escape for me. That's what thrillers are. They're an escape. I was I was a divorce lawyer for 30 years. It was a it was not a very pleasant experience. So uh, I uh, I wrote my thrillers and I read my thrillers to escape that. Wow, that's incredible! I like that. I like that. That's very interesting because when I write as well, it's I write for me. Yeah, and you know that's an interesting point too because when you write for you, I think you wind up completing that story as opposed to uh, as you mentioned earlier in this interview. Too many writers do not finish their work. And I think if they wrote for themselves to please themselves, they would actually continue on until the story culminates, yeah. you know, and is done. Always write what you love. I mean, it's hard enough to write, but God's sakes, don't write something you don't love. <laughs> exactly. Good point. 
Oh, this has just been so enjoyable. You know, one of the things I always focus in on and stories I remember are stories of other people who follow what they love. And even as I'm hearing your backstory of discovering how much you enjoy history and ended up writing about it is such a wonderful takeaway for anyone out there who has an interest. Maybe they don't know everything about it. Maybe there's a skill that they want to develop. And yet you are a living example of someone who followed what they loved so much. And over the course of time and work and practice, you have opened up not only a whole new and vibrant career for yourself, but you've offered something so valuable to so many other people. And I think that there's such a great feeling of accomplishment and satisfaction and even life purpose that goes along with it. So that is a story that I will be sharing with other people about you, Steve. (laughs) Well, thank you. I mean, that's like I said, I, I may not know much about writing or anything like that, but I'm a world class expert on rejection. And, and, I, and I, I know it very, very well. And I'm, I'm an expert on rejection. And so, you know, I tell people all the time, learn from me. I'm living proof that you can actually do it. That's fantastic. Fantastic. Steve, such a great, great, great interview with you. To our audience, New York Times bestselling author, international number one author, Steve Barry. Just love this interview. Thank you so much for just sharing all of this great information. Just really, really great. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you for having me. And Maura, thank you so much for your questions and your interest and enthusiasm as always. You approach life with passion and gusto and it's so infectious <laughs> and i well, can this is go ahead <laughs> and i was just going to say i can see your smiles over the over the airwaves here <laughs> Tony, thank you so much for having me on. I enjoy this. It's wonderful to be able to put people in the spotlight and not only get the information that everybody knows about, but to be able to open people's hearts and minds and aspirations. So thank you for including me. And Steve, it was an honor to get to know you today. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Well, great. Thank you all. And to our Spotlight audience, thank you again. It's our honor to have you listen. All right, everyone, keep your focus on success, and we'll see you next on The Spotlight. We hope you've enjoyed this week's edition of The Spotlight with Tony D'Urso and his special VIP co-host. Be sure to tune in again next Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time, 1 p.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Influencers Channel. Now, enjoy the weekend.